Hi. Oh. Hi. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, second lecture for 188. Let's start with a couple of announcements. First one, Project Zero, Python tutorial, was due yesterday. OK. Um, if you didn't do it, it's not a disaster because it's zero points on it, but it's our way to check that you're in the class. So um, if you didn't do it, we might be worried that you're not in the class. Um, so please do it. It's also a good way to get to know our submission system. There's also a homework zero. It's a math self-diagnostic. Motivation is that the first three to five weeks will be pretty light on math, and then things will change. And when things will change, it will be too late for you to drop the class. And so we want you to be able to know ahead of time what you're getting yourself into and analyze your math skills now while you can still drop rather than after it's too late. Homework 1 search will go out this week. There will be two components, electronic and written. Uh, we'll have an announcement about it later tonight. Um, typically, homeworks are due on Mondays, so kind of get used to that in some sense, but there's an exception next week um, because it's Labor Day on Monday. The homework is going to be due on Tuesday exceptionally. But keep in mind that generally homeworks are going to be due on Mondays. It's just an exception because of Labor Day. Project 1 is also going out this week and will be due um, sometime next week, Friday afternoon. It's longer than most projects. And it's the best way for you to test if programming-wise you are prepared for this class. If your programming goes OK for project one, you should be good for all the future projects. Uh, project zero is not a good way to check if you are prepared for this class. It's just a way to check if you have Python installed and can submit into the system. Sections start this week. First one is happening, I think, today at uh, 4 o'clock. There's a bunch of them today, tomorrow, and then Thursday. Um, you can go to any section you like, but you'll have priority in the one that you signed up for on Piazza. So just in case there's too many people in one room that you don't fit, the people who signed up for that time slot have priority um, if you're one of the first 35 to sign up. Instructional accounts. There are instructions in a Piazza post, our welcome post, that say you need to go find those accounts online. Also that you don't need them, but some of you really want them. And if you really want them, um, there's instructions online. There are some pin posts on Piazza. Um, those are the ones you maximally want to pay attention to. Those are our announcements that are currently relevant or relevant throughout the semester. So keep that in mind. And then the most frequently asked question is, can you add me to B courses? But we don't use B courses for 188. So none of you will be added to B courses. Um, nobody's on it, nobody will be on it. We do use other things, so make sure you know there's a website, there's Piazza, and Gradescope. Any questions about logistics? Yes? Yes, yeah, so homework one will officially release later today, and there will be a post on Piazza that links to all the relevant things for you to work on. So just a little bit more patience for that. Any other logistical questions? Another frequently asked question is, how about AI research? Wouldn't it be cool to do AI research? And I agree. I mean, that's half of my job is doing AI research. The other half is AI teaching. So obviously, I'm with you. AI research is good to do, a lot of fun. Um, the way research tends to work is every professor effectively runs their own lab and has their own methodology on how and when to get new students involved. So if you're interested in AI research, check out the bear.berkeley.edu side. Check out the professors listed there. And then um, check their web pages, see what they work on, see who might be good fits, and then individually contact them. Some of them don't read email. Then your email will not be read, but they might still have office hours or there might be possible other ways to catch in person. Um, every professor has their own way of communicating or not communicating. Um, it varies, but that would be your best starting point, and there's no unified entry into this. It's all on a per-professor basis. Question here. 
Oh, the, the asterisk next to the names uh, refers to um, professors who are kind of at their core working on AI. That's kind of like the main thing they work on, whereas ones without asterisks often work on very closely related topics, but they might not call themselves necessarily AI faculty, but they work on things that in practice are extremely close. In my particular case, the way I tend to recruit students is through email. So you just email me your transcript, your resume, and I look at that and see from there. I gotta warn you, I get like more than 100 per semester, and I can only get three or four or five involved any semester, but you should try, and same thing with other faculty, you should try if you're interested in research, and then see where you might be able to get involved. Any questions about that? Okay, let's get started on the technical topics then. Today's topic is search. Um, what does that mean? We're going to uh, discuss agents that plan ahead rather than just react to a current situation. Um, we'll formalize this into search problems. And this is going to be a kind of recurring theme throughout the course is that we will look at some high-level intuition, some notion of the type of problem we're interested in. We'll then show a formalization. For example, search problem is a formalization of real-world settings into something mathematically um, workable. And then we'll have algorithms that can work with that mathematical interface to solve the problem. And the algorithms we'll see today are depth-first, breadth-first, and uniform cost search, and we'll expand on that in the next lecture. So, agents that plan. Before we dive into agents that plan, let's maybe contrast it by uh, a more naive type of agent, the reflex agent, because that might be the simplest way to just write up some AI agent. So what are reflex agents? Reflex agents are agents that have a current percept, maybe some memory, and based on that, make a decision, but without consideration of the consequences of their actions. So let's see. Who here is maybe like sometimes a reflex agent? Who thinks they're sometimes a reflex agent? Okay, why? So the answer was because sometimes just instinctively you feel what to do and you just do it. You don't reason through all the consequences. Sometimes for good consequences results, sometimes bad, I guess. Um, but a good example would be something where maybe an insect, a fly is flying to your face and you don't want to go, okay, well, if I keep my eyes open, what will happen? If I close them, what will happen? You just want to close your eyes and be done with it. That would be a reflex compared to planning, which is thinking through all the consequences. So reflexes make a lot of sense, especially when you need to react quickly. Um, can reflex agents be rational? Meaning, rational, a rational agent is an agent that optimizes expected utility. I hear a yes. Why, why yes? Anybody? So the answer is, by reacting quickly, you might be doing the right thing. And if you're doing the right thing, indeed, like your hand's in the fire, you pull back right away instead of thinking through the consequences of will this become burned, will it become charcoal, what will the result be? You just pull back. is much more optimal than to maybe reason through everything and might be too late. Um, so our definition of rational means optimal behavior, and how you reach those conclusions is decoupled from whether the agent is rational or not. And so that's a good example. Let's look at a Pac-Man example. So we'll run a demo here of Pac-Man in a very simple world, and the goal is to eat all the dots as efficiently as possible. And we're going to run a reflex agent, which just moves to the nearest by dot. So it looks at the nearest by dot, tries to move in that direction. Here's what happens. There's nothing better available for you to do. So doing something as simple as moving in the direction of the closest dot does succeed. Now, let's look at another case. Same piece of code. Look at the nearest by dot and try to move in that direction. So initially, it's going to go north. 
lot of west, some more north. And it's east, 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 and nothing happens. Because by moving east, it bumps into the wall, encounters the same situation, has the same reflex, repeats over and over and over. And actually, it loses points here. So in the 188 Pac-Man world, when you waste time, or every step that passes, you lose a point to encourage you to be more efficient at completing the game. So this is a reflexation that's clearly not optimal. Um, we really would want it to go around that wall and get the dot, but it's not going to do that. So we've seen a reflex agent that is rational, one that's not rational. Um, oh, quick note here. In the slides that you'll find online, um, the PowerPoint version has the videos of the demos embedded. So if at home you're kind of reworking through the slides and you're like, oh, what happened again in lecture when this demo was run, you can click play and then you can watch the same demo at home as a video rather than a live demo. Okay, so we've seen reflex agents. How about planning agents? Planning agents ask themselves the question, what if? So they hypothesize, if they were to take a sequence of actions, what would the result be? A requirement for this is that the agent has a model of how the world works. If you don't have a model of how the world works, you cannot reason to the possible consequences of your actions. You also have to have some kind of goal, because a planning agent would have sequence of actions it's hypothesizing about and then evaluating them based on whether they achieve the goal or not. The goal could sometimes be a single thing that needs to be achieved or it could be a test, a condition that needs to be met that can be met in many ways and you just need, meet, need to meet the condition in some way. There are questions you'll be able to ask and, and hopefully answer about planning algorithms when we see them. An algorithm could be optimal or suboptimal. Optimal means that you achieve goals in minimum cost. Complete means that when there exists a solution, you find it. And then we'll look at some planning versus replanning in the next demo here. So we'll start with a showcase of a mastermind agent that is planning through everything. So same maze again as we just saw. Now, it's going to be a planning agent. When I hit start, we're going to see some planning happening down here. Let's see. It's actually pre-calculating to be ready for planning. It's done that. It's done 1,000 expansions, 2,000 expansions. This is reasoning through many possible consequences of actions. It's then found what it knows is the optimal sequence of actions to clear this board and then executes that sequence of actions. Now, the reason it took a while for this agent to get going is because there's a lot of sequence of actions to consider, and before you can ensure that you found the optimal one, you have to consider quite a few in this scenario. Sometimes it's not practical to wait this long, and you might want to do something slightly different, which you'll do in some of your project ones also, which is replanning. So what we're going to watch here is an agent that doesn't plan an entire sequence ahead of time, but it just plans to the nearest dot. So it checks, where's the nearest dot? What's my path to get there? Executes that plan. After it's executed that plan, formulates a new planning problem where it will plan path to the next nearest dot and repeats over and over and over. So this one can start acting almost right away and is continuously replanning throughout execution to find shortest path to the next dot. Okay, so we've seen a few examples here. Let's now uh, start formalizing what it means to be a search problem. What are the key components? A state space. So whenever you're formulating a problem in the real world that you try to solve, um, a state space will be something you have to formulate for it. For example, for Pac-Man, the state space is a set of possible configurations of where Pac-Man is and where the dots are. Then a successor function. A successor function says for any given state what the actions are that are available and what the consequent states will be. For example, from this particular state, 
Um, the agent can take either the north action or the east action, and then the results are shown on the right. So the successor function encodes how the world works. They need a start state and a goal test. Start state uh, could be um, wherever you're currently in, and the goal test would be the condition that you want your agent to meet. The solution to your problem would be a sequence of actions, which we'll call a plan, which transform the start state into a state that satisfies the goal condition. Now, the beauty of having this kind of interface up here is that once we agree to an interface like this, any real-world problem we can cast this way if we then have an algorithm that can work with this interface, that algorithm can solve that real-world problem. And so the unifying theme in this lecture and next lecture for casting real-world problems as things we'll solve with our AI algorithms is by casting them as search problems. Okay, search problems are always just models. And so a lot of the art will be in thinking through what it means to be a good model of the problem that you're trying to solve in the real world. So let's look at an example. Let's say you want to find a path. And this is a map, well, a simplified map of Romania. And maybe you want to start in Arad, which would be your start state, and end up in Bucharest, where you have the airport. To model this as a search problem, we need to ask a question, well, what are the states? What's the state space? Any thoughts? So the suggestion is all locations, and that's indeed also the choice we made here. Since we're interested in finding paths, that seems reasonable. But you might go back and say, hey, the way I'm going to model this is actually different. I don't just care about the cities. I care about more details of the path along the way, and then break it down more and so forth. But at some point, you have to make a decision, and this is one reasonable decision. How about successor function? Any thoughts? For any city, whichever cities are neighboring it is the possible successors. So it's defined by the graph here. And the cost associated with the transition would be the distance on that edge. Again, you could make other decisions in practice. You might say, I don't just care about how many kilometers it is between two cities. I care about um, how much traffic there is. Or I care about the number of potholes in the road. You can adjust your cost and increase it if there's more potholes and so forth. But one choice would be distance. Yep. So the question is, if you choose a different state space, might your successor function be different? And the answer is yes. Um, you need to choose them in a compatible way. And we'll see more examples soon where you'll see that, indeed, once you start picking a different state space for the same type of problem, you have different successor functions. Start state, well, if we need to go from Arad to Bucharest, that's Arad. Um, goal test, we need to end up in Bucharest. Um, so is our state equal to Bucharest is our goal test. What's the solution? Well, the solution would be some kind of path, maybe this path over here, or maybe you like this path. We'd have to calculate maybe which one is shorter to find the optimal path. There are even longer ones. Um, but those are possible solutions to the problem. Okay, let's do a few more of these. Here is a Pac-Man environment. And keep in mind, the world state encodes everything about the environment. So the world state would have everything about this board situation. But now the problem we're trying to solve would determine what we want to put in our state space for our search problem. So let's say we want to solve pathing. What will we put into our state space? Any thoughts? Location. So location makes sense because if we have location, we can track where we are and we need to go from some starts to some destinations. That makes sense. Successor function, well, it would be something about north, east, south, west, taking you in a certain direction. And it would have something about where the walls are. Because if you run into a wall, you don't move, you stay put. So that would be encoded into the successor function. Um, then, and the actions are part of your successor function. And then goal test would be, am I at the end state I want to be at? Now let's change it. What if our goal was to eat all the dots? 
what would our state space be now? So the suggestion was food locations and location of Pac-Man. Um, then we need to think about what does it mean to encode food locations. For Pac-Man, we have um, XY coordinates for food, different options. One possibility could be, um, because the map is fixed, we could say for every possible location, there is a 0, 1 Boolean flag saying whether there is still food there or not. So we'd have a long list of 0, 1s, depending on whether there is food or not, together with the coordinates of Pac-Man. How about actions? Actions stay the same, right? Same game, north, south, east, west. How about successor function? Exactly, we now need to update both the location and the binary state of the food. So that's where we have now a different successor function than before. Before, we were able to ignore that. Even though it might change in the real world, we just ignored it because for pathing it didn't matter. But here we have to keep track of it. And then the goal test would be whether dots have all taken on the value of false. And we don't need to worry about where Pac-Man is because that's not part of what we need to achieve. It's just about eating all the dots. OK, so once we understand state spaces, the first question we can ask is, how big is our state space? So here is another maze. Um, there's Pac-Man, there's some ghosts, um, there's 120 possible agent positions, there's a food count, 30 positions, then 12 possible ghost positions for each ghost, and there's an agent, and the agent could be facing north, east, south, west. Okay, so what's the size of this state space? Well, somehow we need to count this. The way you do this, you, you look at all the variables involved and see how many are there. So let's first look at the world state. So world state-wise, how many do we have? Well, agent positions, we have oops, not sure about this vertical bar. We have agents positions, 120 possibilities. Now to know how many total states there are, we need to check everything that varies and effectively multiply the count together. So food count, 30 locations that could be food or no food. So that's 2 to the 30 possibilities multiplied by 120. Each ghost could be in 12 locations, so that's times 12 times 12 for both ghosts. And then the agent could be facing northeast, southwest. So the total number of world states is this product. And the thing that should make you worried here is this one over here. When you have something very large in the exponent, usually the number becomes very large, and so you have something very big to deal with. OK, that's world state. How about search problem state? That depends on the type of problem we're trying to solve. Imagine we're trying to solve eat all dots. OK, well, what do we need for eating all the dots? We went through that on the previous slide. We need the agent position. We need to know where the food is. Since the goats are, ghosts are blocked off, we don't need to know about where the ghosts are, and we also don't need to know about which way the agent is facing. So we end up with 120 times 230. Um, what if it was just pathing? Then all we need to know is the agent position. It would be 120. And so you can start seeing here why mastermind Pac-Man, who was trying to figure out the shortest path to eat all the dots, had to think for a long time because actually eating all the dots means that you have a state space where you need to keep track of which dots are still present or not, and this is going to be very large, especially for a bigger maze, whereas a just pathing problem can be solved a lot more quickly. Any questions about the counts and how this works? Yes? OK. That, that's a really good question. So should we account for instructions about impossible world states? For example, should we account maybe for 
whether ghosts can tunnel through the wall or not. Um, or do you have something else in mind? When, so I think what you're asking is, what's the exact definition of how this world works? And the way it works is that once Pac-Man arrives on a position where there's a food dot, it instantly gets eaten. So there's no such notion as being on that food dot but not yet having eaten it. The eating is automatic. Oh, I see. You're saying in the count. So that's a very good point. When we do this count here, it's a slight overestimate of what actually could happen. There, the state where Pac-Man is in a particular location and there is food there is a state that doesn't happen, and in principle, we could take it out. And so you can actually start subtracting a, in this case, relatively small number of states from that count because they cannot occur. And so what we're doing here, you're absolutely right, is essentially getting a ballpark estimate of how big this problem space is when we estimate it this way. And we tried to get it roughly right, but not up to the exact number. Yes? So 2 to the 30 corresponds to the fact that for each of the 30 food locations, the dot could be present or could be absent. And so every possible combination of presence-absence is 2 to the 30. Okay, now let's do a little quiz. Um, for this problem here, I'd like you to, um, well, let's, let's first define the problem. The problem is defined as, we want to eat all the Pac-Man to eat all the dots while keeping the ghosts scared at all times. So the way Pac-Man works is that if you eat one of those bigger dots, a power pellet, ghosts become scared for a while, and so what we want here is we want a way, we want to find a sequence of actions and a search problem formulation corresponding that will allow us to find that such that we'll keep the ghost scared at all times and eat all the dots. Okay, why don't you talk to each other for a couple of minutes and then we'll see what you come up with as the state space successor function and so forth. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's do this by uh, just committing, in some sense, grow what goes in the state space. Okay, who wants to put something in the state space? Raise your hand. Um, any thoughts? Okay, so let's say I'll write it here. Um, power pellet. Okay. 
remaining locations. Um, a timer for the ghosts. Okay, anybody else wants to add something else? Over there? So the regular food pellets, um, like, yeah, essentially dot booleans as we had before. Anything else? Pac-Man location. So Pac-Man X, Y. Anything else? For there? So that's a good question. So it depends on how this world works, what we might have to put into the state space. So, and I didn't really specify much about that. Anything else? What's a good way to check if, we, if this is enough? And then we can also later check if it's maybe too much. Good way to check is, what do we need from our state space? We need to be able to do a goal check. Like, did we satisfy the goal? Okay, goal is to eat all food pellets. Well, we can definitely check for that. Um, then what else is kind of part of our goal in some sense is to keep the ghost scared at all times. The way we think of that is that the successor function will essentially say, there's nothing left in the game here if the ghosts are not scared. That game is over. So it's like a game over successor state. Okay? And so to be able to have that game over successor state, we need the timer on the ghosts. Otherwise, we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, to be able to know when we reset that timer, we need to know the remaining power pallet locations. Of course, we need to know where Pac-Man is relative to them. Otherwise, we can't encode whether or not these things get eaten or not. So it seems like we need all of these. The food pallets we need for the gold test, and the other three we need for the successor function encoding what's going to happen next when we take an action. And then ghost locations, well, it's a good one. It kind of depends on how you specify the problem. In Pac-Man, if you run into a scared ghost, what often happens is that it respawns alive, unscared, in which case you want that never to happen because you're supposed to be always keeping the ghost scared. And so then you need to keep track of the ghost locations. If you ignore that, if you say, okay, well, we're just going to ignore that ghost respawn unscared, we'll just use the timer as our reference. If we say that's how the world works, then we don't need to keep track of it. And that'll often be a question you have to ask yourself about the problem you're trying to solve, exactly how does this work and what's the right model. On the slides, we kind of assume that the ghosts don't respawn um, alive. But if you thought they were respawning alive, then the right model would be to also keep track of the ghost locations because you'll need to simulate that process in your successor function. Now, w one thing that might be worth highlighting here, when we think about let's say, food pellets, why don't we just keep track of the number of um, food pellets left rather than going into all the details of locations? If you only kept track of the numbers, you wouldn't really be able to do planning. Exactly. So it's important that we don't just pay attention to what the goal check asks us for, but also what we need to do the planning, which is a successor function that reasons about the world. And so whenever you do any of those, Think about, can I check for the goal that's needed in the state? And then, can I encode my successor function using this representation? And then check if there's anything that you didn't need. Anything here that we don't need? Not really. We needed everything that was listed, so we can't discard anything from here. OK, so at this point, what we looked at is how to formulate real-world problems into search problems. And what results from those formulations is essentially a state space graph, which is a mathematical representation of a search problem, where the nodes are abstracted world configurations, might look something like this, and the arcs represent the successor function. And the goal test would correspond to some of the nodes in this graph being uh, 
meeting the goal, the goal condition and other ones wouldn't meet the goal condition. Now, in a state space graph, every state will occur only once. Keep that in mind. We'll soon see things where that's not the case. And we can rarely build this thing in practice. So remember that we had something like 2 to the 30 possible uh, food pellet configurations for even this small world. Well, you, it's very difficult to draw 2 to the 30 different states on a slide or even a bigger piece of paper. And so this is really just an abstract idea for us to think about. We know it mathematically exists. We're never actually going to lay this thing out unless on a slide to explain the principles behind some algorithms. Here's another one, and here's the running example we'll use. This is a really, really, really small search problem, uh, a state space graph for a search problem. And we'll use it as our running example, but keep in mind when we use this that this is just illustrative purposes. In practice, you would never first draw out a state space graph and then solve the problem. You would only implicitly ever deal with this state space graph. What we're actually going to build up when an algorithm runs is called a search tree. Search tree is something that starts with wherever the start state is and then calls a success successor function to see what's possible from there. And they might call the successor function again and so forth. So the search tree, the entire search tree, has all possible plans in it, all possible sequences of actions and their possible consequences. In a search tree, when we think about a node in the search tree, we actually think of it as a sequence of states that have happened. So this node here in the search tree corresponds to starting in the start state, taking the action east, ending up in the state shown there. For most, problem, for most problems we'll look at, we can't build the search tree either. In fact, the search tree will typically be much larger even than the state space graph, because there might be multiple ways to get to the same state. And in that case, the search tree will have multiple occurrences of that same state. And so often it's much, much bigger than the state space graph, but it is the underlying abstraction we're going to work with. So here for our very small example, on the left is the state space graph, on the right is the search tree. Assuming start state is S, search tree is rooted in the start state, and then from there, it looks at all possible consequences of actions. Again, we're never going to construct any one of those when we actually write code and solve real problems. But on the slides, for illustrative purposes, we will have them. Key will be in our algorithms that we'll construct these on demand as needed rather than ahead of time. OK, let's do a quick quiz. Here is a four state. Uh, state space graph. What would the search tree look like for this state space graph, and how big would it be? I'll give you like 30 seconds to talk to your neighbor, and we'll see what you come up with. All right, what do we think? Any thoughts on how big the search tree is for this state space graph? Over there. Answer infinite. Anybody wants to throw something else out than infinite? We're all going with infinite? Infinite is a good choice. Um, why is this infinite? Well, think about how do you build a search tree? You start at S, you can go to A. Or B. From A, you could go to B or G. From B, you could go to A or G. Or you can go to B or G. And even just this first path in the search tree is already infinitely long. Not to mention that there is even more of them here. Um, so what we see here is that we end up with an infinite search tree, even though the state space graph is actually quite small. So let's look at an algorithm on how to build up this search tree in a very incremental way, just enough to find a solution and then stop and return the solution. 
Okay, let's do an example. We'll do pathing for Romania. Um, what does the search tree look like? Well, as you run search, you start with the start state. You then expand out to potential next states. These are potential plans. These are one action plans. Then there is two action plans living here, and so forth. And the hope is that somehow we want to explore as little as possible of this giant search tree, yet find a solution. So it would go tier by tier, and we'd hope that we find a solution relatively quickly before we've traversed everything in the search tree. Here's an algorithm to do this. It's called tree search. It'll be the foundation of what we'll be doing this and next lecture. Um, how does it work? Initialize your search tree with just the initial state of the problem. That's the only thing you put in it. And then you loop. You check. If there are no candidates for expansion, what's a candidate for expansion? You have your search tree. You look at all the leaves of your search tree. Those are all candidates for expansion. If, that, if there are non-zero number of leaves, that means you have candidates for expansion. You, if there are none of them, that means you only have dead ends left in your search tree, and you're done, and you didn't find a solution. But if there are candidates, leaf nodes, then we pick one according to some strategy. We still have to determine that strategy, but we'll have many options, and somehow we pick one. Then we check. If that node is a plan that ends up in the goal state, in one of the goal states, then you return the corresponding solution, and you're done. If not, then you call the successor function on that node, on the last state in that node, and expand from there, and go back around. What are the key ideas? There's the fringe, which is a set of leaf nodes that are waiting to be expanded. There's the process of expansion, where you pick one out of the fringe and expand it. But before you do, of course, you check if it might already achieve the goal. And then there's the strategy. Which one of the elements of the fringe are you going to pick first to expand? Um, and there's a lot of different strategies we'll look at. OK, let's run through an example. So how do we do this? We start with the start state. And I will have two things going on. On the left, I will expand the search tree. And on the right, this is kind of what will be um, in code happening uh, for your projects. So how does it start? There is just S. And you'll just have S on your fringe. So this is the fringe as stored in your code. And this is the search tree. Well, what can we do? We only have one option, so we pick S. What happens after S? We can end up in D, E, or P. The way we'll denote that here is that S got expanded, got taken out of the fringe, and instead we have S to D, S to E, S to P. All right, now we again look at our fringe. Pick one. Which one do you want to pick? Hearing E. OK, let's go with E. We pick E from our fringe. First step, so we we'll pick this one here, which corresponds to this one here. We say, OK. Does this achieve the goal condition? No. OK, then we expand. What does expand to? We can, from E, we can go to H or R. So we expand to H or R in your code. This one would have disappeared. And you'd have S to E to H and S to E to R. Now our fringe in it has four members. Which one do you want to pick? Any preference? People choosing H? OK, interesting choice. Because um, <laughs> the goal is here. But you know that's a strategy. That's a thing. And we hope that in the future, our computer programs will have good strategies. Um, so H, well, from H, we can end up in P or Q. And here, the way it would look is that this would disappear from the fringe, and instead we'd have S to E to H to P, S to E to H to Q. All right, what do we pick next? Q. We're, we're really going, going down a rabbit hole here. OK. Um, 
We're picking Q next. It is a strategy. Um, it's the this year's 188 strategy. Um, <laughs> so we pick Q. Is it at the goal? No. So then we expand. Does it have successors? Actually, it doesn't have any successors. So this kind of just dies off here. Nothing can happen from here. We pick this off, and Fringe has one less in it. We need to pick again. What do we pick next? Let's pick, let's pick R. Because um, <laughs> search trees are very big. If we build the entire search tree, even for this problem, it's going to take a long time. So let's try to be effective. R seems a pretty good choice. From R, we can end up in F. Over here, it means that this guy disappears, and instead we have S to E to R to F. What do we pick next? I hear many. Let's, let's do F among the many choices. Um, F allows us to get to G and to C. Okay, this one goes off. We have S to E to R to F to G, S to E to R to F to C. At this point in our algorithm, we do not declare success. You might say, why not? We found a path. It'll matter in the future that we don't. And it's one of the most frequently occurring bugs in your project one that you just declare success at this point. It's too soon. That's not how the algorithm works. We wait. We go to our fringe again and look for candidates for expansion. What might, might we pick? Well, let's pick the one that ends in G. We pick it for expansion. We check, does it achieve the goal? The answer is yes. Now we declare success. It's not going to be obvious if you haven't seen search before why this is important, the sequencing, but it will start mattering, and we'll see soon why. OK, so at this point, we expanded this one, which is this one here. We declare success, and we found S to E to R to F to G as our path. Great, we did it. Here is a on the slides typeset version, the same thing, um, a slightly faster version than what we chose. It also highlights the actual search tree. So the actual search tree is a lot bigger than the part that needs to be explored to find a solution. OK, let's take a two-minute break here. And after the break, let's explore different strategies to choose nodes for expansion. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about the uh, first half? Let's look at our first choice of strategy, depth first search. Who here has seen depth first? OK, many of you. So it should be a good review that will ground everything else we're going to see in something you already know. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, we're not going to leave anything out. There will be full coverage of depth-first search. 
Um, what would depth first search mean for this pathing problem here? Well, what makes depth first depth first? It's the choice of which node to expand first from the fringe. Initially, there's only one node, S. So no choice is to be made. Every search algorithm will do the same thing. Um, every strategy expands S. Now we have three choices. Which one to pick? Depth first says pick the deepest one first. They're all equally deep. So need to break some ties. Maybe we break ties alphabetically and pick D first. Now on the fringe, we have five candidates. Depth first search says pick the deepest one first. There's three deepest ones. We'll break ties alphabetically again. Expand that one. Now there is, again, five on the fringe. Depth first search will pick the deepest one first. There's only one deepest one. Only choice is to pick this node over here, which encodes going from S to D to B to A. As always in tree search, you check, did it achieve the goal? It did not. Then call the successor function, has no successors, and this has been uh, explored, and nothing left there. Four left on the fringe. Pick the deepest one. Again, there is ties. Pick one of them. We break ties alphabetically here. And this process kind of repeats, streaking left to right, if we do alphabetical tie-breaking, um, through this search tree until it decides to expand the goal state, at which point it's done. OK, one possible strategy, depth first. Um, now let's think about the properties of this algorithm. And let's first take a step back. What are properties we might want to quantify about any algorithm, not just depth first search? Well, one is completeness. Is an algorithm guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Another one is optimality. Is it guaranteed to find an optimal path, a least cost path, if one exists? Um, time complexity, how long does the compute take to find a solution? And space complexity, how much memory do you need in the process of that compute to get the competition done? So to do this, we'll use a cartoon of a search tree. Here's our search tree cartoon. Um, we have a start state at the top, and from there, we might expand through the successor function. And we're going to have a few variables here to quantify things. So B is the branching factor. It says, essentially saying, how many successors are there from any given node? And for simplicity in this cartoon, we'll assume every node has as many successors as any other node, which is B. Okay. So then the next, after one choice of action, there is B possible uh, next states, after which we have B options in each one of them, which gives us B squared possible states after two actions, and so forth. Um, Actually, it should be more precise. These are not states that we're counting, but nodes in the search tree. We'll assume there's some maximum depth. You cannot go deeper than a certain depth. We'll call that M. So somehow, once you have taken M actions, there is nothing left. Um, so that means that this entire search tree in the last layer will have B to the M nodes. Again, M in the exponent is the thing that should worry you. If M is very large, this could be a very large search tree and you wouldn't want to explore all of it. There could be solutions at various depths. For example, there might be a solution all the way at the end, but also solutions somewhere that takes less actions to get to the solution. And there could be multiple ones. So there, in this case, there is two states that satisfy the goal, or two nodes that achieve satisfying the goal condition. Number of nodes in the entire tree tends to be dominated by the number of nodes in the last layer. It's a little more than that, but because of the exponential growth, the last layer dominates what you have, and so we'll say order b to the m. You can make it b to the m plus 1 if you want, but that's kind of the ballpark we're working with. OK, so now let's look at properties of depth first search. What nodes does DFS expand? Well, here's our cartoon tree. It streaks through left to right um, until it finds a solution. So based on that, we can start thinking about what work does it do? What's the time complexity of depth first search um, if it has to traverse this thing? Worst case could be the entire tree. If that solution lives all the way at the end here, it's the entire tree. So that would be a lot of work. So but let's say m is finite, then that means that worst case, it needs to do order b to the m amount of work. 
how much space does it take while doing the search? Okay, now we need to think about what the algorithm does. The algorithm maintains a fringe, a fringe of possible nodes for expansion. Let's say we're, we're going depth first, and um, we have maybe, we currently have gone all the way here. What's on our fringe at that moment? Well, from the node above here, there were a bunch of options. And the ones on the right, we haven't done yet. So those are on the fringe. Actually, they will be living over here. So those are on the fringe. Then the node before that will also have had a bunch of options. And these are on the fringe. This line doesn't belong. Um, then same for the node before, and so forth. So how many is that? If we count our way to the top, it's m deep. So there's m such um, successor split points. And each of them can have b successors. So there's b times m on our fringe. So that's not too bad. Space complexity of depth first search is actually uh, very nice. Um, is it complete? Will it find a solution if one exists? Can the tree be infinite? So the one answer is yes, another one is well, might it depend on whether the tree is infinite or not? It's a good question. Um, so let's assume the tree cannot be infinite. What can happen? Well, the first search will streak through the entire tree, and then at some point we'll find a solution if it exists and return it. How could this tree be infinite? Well, we saw a state space graph with only four nodes that had an infinite tree. So definitely infinite trees exist even for small state spaces. So it's complete if the tree is not infinite, if we have some finiteness assumptions. Um, is it optimal? No. It just goes left to right, and it might find whatever happens to be most left and could be pretty bad. Um, how about breadth-first search? Breadth-first search is a different strategy, where instead of taking the deepest one, we take the shallowest one first. So it's like we're stripping off layer by layer what's in the search tree. So what would this look like? On the same problem, we can start with S. We have no choice, only one to pick from the fringe, expand. Then shallowest first, that's breadth first. Well, they're all equally shallow. So, well, pick one, break ties uh, alphabetically, D. How about now? Now, these two are more shallow than the other ones. So they're going to be called upon first. Arbitrary tie breaking, let's say alphabetical, E comes first. And so we go through this search tree layer by layer by layer until at some point we reach a level where we find the goal and then at some point we can declare success. So a very different way of traversing this search tree. What nodes does BFS expand? If look at our cartoon here. Well, essentially we'd expand all the nodes until you explore this guy, so everything up here would be expanded. And then actually it would have expanded into a little bit here, because it only declares success once you expand the goal, once you're about to expand the goal. So that's the part of the tree you would have covered. So what's the time complexity then? Well, the time complexity of visiting all of those depends on the depth of the solution. If the solution is pretty shallow, it'll find it relatively quickly. So let's call the depth of the solution S, then time complexity would be roughly B to the S. How about space complexity? What do we store on the fringe in this process? Well, as we go deeper and deeper, this search tree grows, exp exponential expansion. So at the very end, it's when we're going to have the most on our fringe. What we'll have on the fringe is these nodes here that have not been expanded yet. And then these also that are waiting to be expanded next. How many of those are there? Well, we're at depth S. So it's going to be roughly order B to the S nodes that are sitting on, this fringe, on the fringe when you expand that goal node and declare success. Is it complete? Does it always find a solution if one exists? Who thinks yes? Raise your hands. Most people think yes. Yeah, because it just works through the search tree, and once the, once the solution is there, at some point it'll find it. Is it optimal? Who thinks yes? 
Who thinks no? Most people think no. Um, it could be somewhat debatable. In general, it's not optimal. Maybe it depends how you define optimality. If all costs of actions are the same, it's always action cost of one. It is optimal because it finds the sequence of actions that's shortest to achieve the goal. But if your costs are different for different actions, it's not guaranteed in any way to find the cheapest sequence of actions. Okay, let's do a little quiz on DFS versus BFS. Um, we'll do some fun animations here. Let's see. Um, first one. Okay, what I want to showcase here is either depth first search or breadth first search, breadth first in action. And what we're going to show is in the state space, which is every grid square is a possible state, and green is the start, red is the goal. Whenever for the first time we call the successor function on a particular state, we'll highlight it. Okay? Let's run one of the two algorithms. What's this one? Breadth first, because nearby states get expanded before faraway states get expanded. How about this one? <laughs> it did find a solution. <laughs> it's not the shallowest one in the search tree. Um, depth first search. Now, what if we do this in the context of some obstacles? So black squares are ones you cannot get through. They're walls. The blue squares are squares you can visit. Let's again see what's what. Okay, I'll run one of the two. You call out which one it is. Um, who says breath first? Okay, everyone, great. Um, it was breath first search. And the way you see it is that it expands from the start state out. It's not radially symmetric now because the walls are blocking some paths and it's based on the length of those paths, not based on sh straight line distance. Um, but this is breadth first search. Um, how about this one? Who thinks breadth first? Nobody? Depth first? Okay, depth first search. Um, finds a solution again, but not maybe the one you'd hope for. Okay. Might there be some trade-offs here, though? When might BFS outperform DFS and the other way around? Any thoughts on when which one might be preferable? Here. So suggestion was, if the goal is shallow and to the right in the tree, B BFS will drastically outperform DFS, which will sweep the entire tree before finally getting there. Yeah, definitely a big advantage there for BFS. Any other thoughts about trade-offs? Here. All of these examples, you only have one goal, but if you have like many satisfiable outcomes, they're all hmm. far away. But then you want to do a depth first search. So the suggestion is that maybe when there's many, many goals in the tree, and they're all very deep, so you need to go deep anyway, then maybe depth first search will find them first because breadth first will be so busy before it finally is willing to look at anything at the bottom. And actually, we'll see exactly that scenario in lecture, let's see, four next week, uh, Tuesday. So that's a nice case where DFS has the advantage. Any other thoughts about trade-offs? Over there. Yeah, so the suggestion is, if you have memory limitations, DFS is so much better in terms of memory than BFS, so maybe you just have to use it, even when maybe you want to find a shortest path. You just have no choice because you'd run out of memory using breadth first. Any other thoughts? Yes? So BFS has the advantage of finding the shortest path. Okay, now let's see if we can combine some of those all in one. 
So we like BFS because it finds shortest path based on counting number of actions. Um, if a um, short solution exists, it doesn't spend time exploring the entire tree. It just needs to find the short solution. Um, but DFS has better memory properties. So can we bring them both together in one algorithm, get the benefits of all of these? Turns out we can. Something called iterative deepening. And the idea is to get the space advantage of DFS built into a breadth-first search, or you can think of it the other way around, you're essentially just bringing them both together. What's the idea here? You always run depth-first search, because that's the memory-efficient one, and you're not willing to forgo that. But you cap the depth to which you're willing to search. So your first run, when you hit depth one, you stop. Your successor function is modified to say there's nothing beyond depth one. This is it. You have to stop. If you don't find a solution that way, then you make the cap two. If you find a solution, that's great. You found the solution with only two steps. But if you don't find a solution, you make the cap three. And you keep expanding your cap. You can always run depth first search. So you never run into memory issues. Yet, you are also not going down rabbit holes on the far left that might lead nowhere, but be really, really big. Because remember, the bottom of the tree is exponentially large compared to the top. And if you spend a lot of time at the bottom, you're going to be spending a lot of time overall. So a very simple way to uh, solve search and getting the best of both worlds. You might wonder, is this not wastefully redundant? Am I not like redoing the work for the first and the first one every time and the second one every time but the first time, the third one every time but the first two? Yes, there is some waste happening. But if you think about it, it's not that bad. And the reason it's not that bad is because the last layer is so much bigger than the previous layers. In fact, the last layer tends to be as big as all previous layers combined. And so the redundant work you do is not that much compared to you need to expand that last layer anyway to find out new results. That's also where this cartoon is kind of misleading, by the way. This looks like something that just grows linearly, effectively, with depth in size. Like this, the, the width there is linearly with depth, but in practice exponential, which we can't really um, draw in just two dimensions. OK, now let's switch gears to a different kind of problem formulation. What if we care about the cost? Not just cost one for each action, but different actions could have different costs. For example, this transition costs three, this one costs two, and so forth. How do we find the shortest path accounting for cost? OK, uniform cost search will do that for us. So how does this work? It's kind of inspired by breadth-first search, which expands shallowest first, but now we'll look at least cost first. So it starts out with expanding from S. We have three nodes in the fringe. And instead of picking shallowest or deepest, we pick based on lowest cost. This one has one, this one nine, this one three. We pick P, um, we expand. Then we check again, which is lowest, three, nine, or 16, three is lowest, we expand D. And we repeat this process now what's lowest, um, four is lowest, and we expand that one. Now what's lowest is five. And keep in mind, there's actually cumulative cost. So when it says five, that is a cost of three going from S to D, a cost of two going from D to E, cumulatively five. And so our lowest cumulative cost on the fringe is five. That's what we expand next. Next lowest is um, six. We go with six next. Um, and we keep going popping things from the fringe based on lowest cost first. Um, right now, lowest cost is um, nine over here. We also see the goal sit on the fringe. This is where it starts mattering what we do. We're always picking the lowest one. Even though the goal is there, you might say, why don't we call it quits? We see the goal, we call it done, we found the path. No, we still pick the one with lowest cost nine. Because you don't know. Maybe from that one with nine, there is one with cost only 0 0.5 that leads to the goal. And if we already declare success here with the goal, we would not have found that one. So we still got to try this because it's only nine so far, and it could maybe achieve goal at cheaper cost than the one we see there. Now the lowest cost on the fringe is 10, and it corresponds to the goal state, and we can declare success. And we're guaranteed it's optimal. Why? We have in the search tree explored every single path that you can 
traverse with a cost of 10 or less. There is nothing left you can do with a cost 10 or less. Everything else that exists will cost you more than 10. And we found a goal with cost of 10, so we know that's the optimal way to get to the goal. We again get a tiered expansion, but this time the tiering is not based just on layers, but based on cost encountered so far. Let's look at the properties. What nodes does it expand? Well, it's based on cost. So to quantify this, we'll have to say something about cost. Um, and so if, let's say, the optimal solution has a cost C star, and each individual step costs us at least epsilon, then we might have expanded plans that take C star over epsilon actions to get there, right? So if every action costs at least epsilon and the goal is C star, then the longest path we could get below C star is C star over epsilon. Okay, so that's what we expand in the tree. Anything that is less than that many actions, um, we will call this the effective depth. And so the computational cost in principle could be branching factor B to the power effective depth. So it'll be exponential in the effective depth. How much space does the fringe take? Um, well, what's happening when we're expanding, for example, when we're here, and we're about to expand, um, let's see, we wouldn't, so we're about to expand this one, let's say, if, let's say if this is our fringe right now, here, and we're ex about to expand this one here, how much is on the fringe? Well, how many nodes we can have here depends on the depth in the search tree. Our effective depth is C star over epsilon. So the amount of space taken would be B to the effective depth, which is same as our computational complexity. Is it complete? Will it always find a solution if a solution exists? Yes because it'll systematically keep working through the search tree till it finds that path. Um, there is some subtleties there about you know, cost being positive and not getting looped into some negative cost uh, cycles, but assuming that's all satisfied, we're good. Is it optimal? Yes, because whenever we expand the goal state, we know there's nothing left that's cheaper than the path we just found to the goal state. Everything on the fringe has a higher cost. And so it can never, assuming all costs are positive, come below what we have right now as our path to the goal. We'll do a formal proof with A star search, which is an extension of this in the next lecture. What are some issues? Well, um, it explores these kind of increasing uh, cost uh, sets of nodes. It's nice, it's complete and optimal, but the bad is that it explores in every direction which could be very expensive. It doesn't really think about where the goal might be, and that's where the next lecture will come in, to focus your search on things that are promising rather than things that have been cheap so far. So uniform cost search thinks of all these things as equally good, but if you were more informed, going towards the goal would be preferable. Let's look at the demo of UCS in action. So... In this maze, black is still intraversible. There is shallow waters and there is deep waters. Okay? The dark blue is deep water and it's more expensive to traverse. And the shallow uh, water is the fainter blue and it's cheaper to traverse. So if we run uniform cost search, what would we expect? We would hope that it would spend more time in the shallow waters because it's cheaper to expand there but as needed, also visit the deeper waters if that turns out to be the cheapest way to get to the goal. Let's see what happens. We see indeed that it kind of blocks on the deeper waters while more quickly expanding in the shallow waters. Let's play this again. And this is the behavior you hope for for uniform cost search. Remember, of course, if you run something like um, breadth first search, it would completely ignore the shallow versus deep water is just based on number of actions and expansion is just as fast in the deep water versus shallow when it's doing the search. And of course, depth first search um, completely ignores kind of everything 
um, <laughs> but still finds a solution. So we'll fix this soon to pay more attention to how far you're away from the goal and, and target your search. For this lecture, um, let's uh, spend a little bit of time on unifying what we've seen so far and then show some of the limitations. So remember when we defined the search algorithm, tree search, we had the same algorithm for DFS, BFS, and uniform cost search. The only thing that differed was the strategy of what to pick next from the fringe. And so one way in your project one, for example, to implement everything with essentially one piece of code is if you have a priority queue and you just use different priorities for different types of searches. If it's depth first, priority is based on how deep you are. Deeper is better. If it's breadth first, priority is based on how shallow you are. Shallow is better. And if it's uniform cost, priority is based on how much cost you've encountered so far on this path. So a single implementation that can unify everything. Can search go wrong? Well, let's look at some examples from drawn from the real world. Here is MapQuest, an old um, path planning thing for driving. Let's take a look at what it was asked to find the path to a destination. And all goes pretty well until over here it decides to take this turn, which happens to be this turn over here for your car. <laughs> Doesn't work. So what we see here is a mismatch between how the map was made and what your search problem then could work on compared to the real world. So it doesn't mean that A star failed or uniform cost failed or depth first, breadth first failed. It just means that your search problem formulation was not abstracting the world the right way. Here's another example of search in action. <laughs> What's happening here? Is this the search algorithm having a bug? It's possible, but most likely that's not what it is. What's going on is that probably somewhere near to the destination here, somehow the map is incomplete, and it lacks a way to get to the destination from this side. The path is just not in the state, spa in the state space graph, and as a consequence, when you run search, well, it's just calling successor, 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 and this happens to be what it finds, which involves taking your car on a boat trip, multiple boat trips, uh, before you get there. So keep, keep this in mind. Um, whenever you are doing search for real-world problems, building the right models is really critical to get good results. All right, that's it for today. See you on Thursday. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the email. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, I just want to know when when's your office hours again? Now. It's now. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Which room is it? I'll walk there. It'll be in 7:30 Sakarja Dai Hall. Okay. So I'll just kind of walk out from here with students who have questions to the office hours. Okay. Uh, okay. Like, is it an hour or two or? It's 3:30 till 4:30. Okay. Cool. And uh, it's likely going to be every Tuesday, 3.30 to 4.30, okay. but it's not 100% set yet. Okay. I have another, like, uh, unrelated question to the course. Sure. Uh, would you, by any means, like, have maybe 15 or 30 minutes someday to talk over an idea I have for founding a company within machine learning? Like, so, I just, for that, yeah. um, our... Like, what I would like to do this semester um, is kind of have a couple of dedicated office hours for okay. things like that. So typically office hours, I would prioritize whoever has questions about the class. Of course, and that's, of course, sense. why you're asking it. Um, and so I plan to, most, most of my schedule for October is clear to announce a couple of office hours for people who want to talk specifically about things that are not class related, and then we can slot those in there. Okay, and you'll uh, announce that in October? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Uh, on, on the Piazza forum or, or Piazza somewhere? and in class probably both. Okay, and thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that'll be all. Okay, great. Thanks, awesome. They said something about the ventilation <laughs> is off. <laughs> that's okay. what they said, which is pretty precise, I think. Yeah, that's And now that you're, it helps us. I, I no. might even have offered that as a reason. <laughs> <laughs> was that a good question? So, is, uh, so for questions, um, let's walk out of the room.
Is the next class going to get started? And let's take questions outside and then start walking back to the dial.